Hi, I'm Bob German, and uh, a couple times ago I did a presentation here uh, in the same esteemed group about um, the uh, plug-in model for Copilot, and I showed a Northwind Copilot plug-in, and uh, it went well, and it was kind of popular, but it actually, I ran out of time and didn't get to show any of the code or any of the details. So. Um, Vesa asked me to come back and uh, kind of do the other half of it. So that's what I'm going to do today. So just a, a really quick, and then I'll, the good news is that there's, um, there, there's hands-on labs and you can build these yourself. You can actually follow the instructions and run this yourself if you have access to Copilot in Microsoft 365. So um, just a quick reminder of how this works. Um, the, uh, there are two ways to extend Copilot in Microsoft 365. One is with a graph connector, which actually brings your content into uh, the semantic index so that Copilot can use it. And the other is a plugin, which essentially teaches Copilot in real time how to how to query your service and bring the responses into um, Microsoft 365 Copilot. So that's what I'm going to show today. And I thought I would start with sort of the most basic approach to show you all how to get started really quickly. So I'm going to kind of get back into my little time machine here and uh, kind of wind back the, the wheels of time and show you how I created this thing at the very beginning. So I went into Teams Toolkit and I created a message extension using the bot framework. And that gave me this project right here. And so it actually kind of opens a new copy of Visual Studio Code for you when you do that. So um, again, I'll point you to the lab at the end, and it has instructions on what to install on your end. Um, I sped this up. Can you tell? This actually takes quite a while to run the first time. Um, and what I get is a test message extension. So very, very simple. It doesn't do a whole lot. But what it does is it looks things up in the Node Package Manager um, list. So there's a public web service for that. So they just decided to use that as the boilerplate. And here I typed in uh, Teams FX and I get back the Teams FX React library. So super simple, not a lot going on there. Now without, I didn't write, you didn't see me write any code, right? I didn't write any code. Um, now let's see it in Copilot. So I just say search test ME. You have to mention the name of the plugin right now for it to work. And um, ta-da, there it is. There's the, uh, it actually did, it reached in to the little test message extension and um, and pulled in this data. And, but if I ask it, what is the most popular? It, it's, it doesn't know, right? Which is better than having it make up an answer, I suppose. But what, what happened here is that my, that message extension really had no um, no query for, uh, you know, popularity or how many people have downloaded it. All it had in there was the, um, the name. And, and so that's kind of where you start with the default. So what I'd like to do today is kind of walk you through the steps, the changes that I had to make and, um, also, uh, highlight Robbie Williams and Gary Trinder who helped me out with different parts of this, uh, uh, Ravi did all the adaptive card work. Gary did all the Azure deployment. So just want to share the, the credit on all of that. Um, so here I am in Copilot for Microsoft 365. And one thing I didn't show in that other demo is this little plug-in panel. So you have to turn on. There's an administrative switch to enable plugins in the first place. And then if that's turned on, you'll see this little plug-in panel. And you can pick the plugin that you want to enable or multiple plugins if you want to. And now if I, again, I have to mention the name of the plugin. So I can say something like, uh, please, I'm polite to AI. I don't know about you. Um, is anybody else bother with that? So please um, uh, look up Chai in Northwind. And this is um, kind of a favorite query of mine. 
So I'm not going to get as fancy. <clears throat> Last time, you can go back and watch the recording if you missed it. I did a bunch more interesting prompts. Some of them bring in um, multiple results, format them in different ways, correlate it with documents in SharePoint. So there's a, you know, that was sort of like the end user view of it mostly, and then a little bit about the manifest. But just to remind you, here it is again. And yes, I can click take action and I can say, yeah, let's order uh, 50 more of these. And you'll see that the number on order went up, right? So that's kind of that's kind of what I'm going to dig into here. So as I mentioned, I started with that same um, kind of out of the box experience uh, from Teams Toolkit. And the next step then was to add to the manifest. So here's the manifest, which is really a um, which is really a template, right? So you can see it's going to plug some things in from Teams Toolkit, like the app ID and the environment uh, and things like that. And then we get down here to compose extensions, which is um, we started with a message extension. Guess what? Somebody decided to rename. It was originally called a Compose extension. Now it's called a Message extension. So in the manifest, it's still a Compose extension. And the original solution just had the you know one command. So this is an array of commands. It had one command, and that command was for looking up the NPM package by name. Now you can see that we have a lot more. We have I have multiple commands, and some of the commands have multiple parameters. So um, I want to kind of flag Tom Morgan put out an excellent video and I'll see if I can find the video, um, the URL and post it in the chat later um, talking about how important it is. And he talked about a number of good things relating to this topic. But one of the things I really appreciated is his point about how important the, the descriptions are, because this is how Copilot knows what your plugin does. So not only do we have descriptions on the app, but also on each command and also on the parameters. And sometimes they're quite detailed, like telling it what format to use or what different choices are and that kind of thing. So I added all of that into the solution uh, and also multiple different commands. So there's this inventory search command. There's also discount search and revenue search. So those are the manifest changes. Then what happened is... Um, there, so Teams Toolkit generates this uh, this program this module called searchapp.ts, and this kind of handles the plumbing of it. So you can see here, um, it's inheriting from something called Teams Activity Handler, which is really a a Teams bot framework, bot, but it's not really we're not using it for chat purposes. We're just using it as a secure channel to communicate with. And whenever anybody uses the message extension, whether it's a human or copilot, it's going to call this function here called uh, Teams Activity Handler. And so what I've done is I took the activity handler that was there that just sort of inline called the uh, NPM endpoint. And I replaced it with this one, which looks at the command ID. These are the command IDs from the manifest. So if I kind of go back to that manifest, oops, sorry about that. If I kind of go back to that manifest and um, you'll see that each one of these commands has an ID like discount search, inventory search, right? And then if I go into back into search app.ts, um, these are the command IDs that are inside. So I basically decided to break each one of these message extension commands down into its own module. So for instance, product search command, the command ID is inventory search. That matches the one in the manifest, right? And so what's happening here is the switch statement is gonna look and say, well, which command did this request come in for? It was the product search, the discounted search, or the revenue search. And based on that, it's going to call one of these three modules. So now here inside of product search, um, we're going to go ahead and look up the information from that. And remember that this one has five different parameters to it. 
So for debug purposes, there's no way to use more than the first parameter in the message extension UI. So to facilitate um, debugging, I'm actually going to split this uh, and allow a comma separated list of parameter values. So if I wanted to, I could type product name, comma, category name, or I could type like comma, comma, low, which is one of the inventory status values and get all the products that were low on stock. But when they come from Copilot, I have to look at the names of each element. So I'm going to get my query parameters and I'm going to find the, the element with the name, product name, category name. Once again, these are matching exactly what was in the manifest file. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, find the products. So this is uh, calling the, the Northwind database itself, which is now in Azure Table Storage, uh, thanks to the good work of Gary Trinder. And um, we get the result list and are going to generate a card for each one of the results. And to do that, we're going to, I'm going to call this function called get edit card. So remember that in your mind because I'm going to I'm going to back out of this and go to another path before we go and look at the card handling. Back here in search app, what if somebody clicks on one of those actions at the bottom of the card? That's the other time that we need to to run our application. And this can be a bit a uh, small point of confusion because this is not actually ha handled by um, the uh, this is not actually handled by Copilot. So Copilot displayed my card here, right? It displayed the card, but when I edit the card or do something with the card, I'm actually talking directly. The card is talking directly with my application. So when that happens, I'm going to get this uh, adaptive card invoke is going to get called. And it's going to have a verb, which corresponds to the buttons on the card. OK is I'm going to uh, update the stock level. Restock is I'm going to order some more. Or cancel is I'm going to cancel my order. And that calls, again, um, these different functions, these different action handler functions. So now let's, let's take a look at that card handling here. So again, this was just my way of modularizing it. You don't have to break it down this way. Um, but here's the uh, here's the, the get edit card. So this is where either user using the uh, message extension or maybe it was the um, copilot calling my message extension. I'm going to go in and get an edit card. And you know what? If I need, if I have 12 results uh, or 10 results or five results, I'm going to build five adaptive cards. I'm going to build a result for each adaptive card, and um, Copilot is going to figure out which one or which ones to display. So how does this one work? Well, I've got my edit card. So you saw the cards. Let me kind of go back here. Um, this is the success card. Let me, let me do this again. So um, please look up Tofu in Northwind. So I'll do a different one. And this is going to be the edit card. And then when I actually do the edit, it's going to swap in the success card that has the little green success bar at the top. So um, that's just kind of how it's working under the, under the covers, right? So this is the edit card. And then when I say I decide to restock and order 10 more units of this, it's actually going to replace the edit card with a success card. They look the same by design. They don't have to look the same, but that's the way we made it. So here's the edit card. And this is an adaptive card, and it's using adaptive card templating, meaning that we're actually going to um, but data bind data from the product from the database into this card. And that's how all that data shows up is these little binding expressions. Also notice there's a refresh here. That's because Rabia coded this up to be, to use the universal action model um, that works for adaptive cards across different surfaces. And the card can refresh if there's, if it's say used somewhere else on the same, 
if the same card appears for more than one user. Um, and then if I kind of go down towards the bottom, you'll see that I have a thing called an action set. So the action set is those buttons at the bottom. And the first one is, remember there's a, there's this take action button that shows and hides the other fields, right? So that take action button is here, right? That's the action.show card, which shows a smaller child card or toggles the smaller child card on and off. But what is, what's in the small child card? Well, I've got my input of the quantity, and then I've got the three buttons for update, restock, and cancel. And remember, that's what was in my switch statement, was these verbs right here. That's what's handling those. So I'm going to post back, basically. When somebody clicks one of those buttons, it's going to post back the uh, value in this, in this text field plus the product ID, which got bound when we generated the card. Why? Because it's not enough to say, please order 10 more units. The code needs to know 10 units of what, right? So that's where the product ID has to come back in. So now if I go back to my card handler, the first thing it's doing is it's reading in the edit card and it's going to bind it with all this data from the database. And that's what this template.expand is doing. Then it's going to return the adaptive card, which gets returned to the query and along with maybe a bunch of them, a bunch of adaptive cards if I had multiple results. Now let's suppose I went to update the stock. So this is going to call handle Teams card action update stock. <coughs> went because the invoke activity came in to my application down in search app.ds. And so I'm going to log that. And here on line 43, I'm actually getting the data. So this is going to get me back the text field. And it's also going to get me the, um, the at which button was pushed and the product ID. So here is, uh, I need to make sure in order to do this, I need to get the stock value and the product ID. Assuming that I have both of those, I'm going to go ahead and get the product and uh, update the number in stock and update it. So these are just my database commands here that are actually, this is, re this is real. It's not production quality code, but it's, it's actually updating the database. And then it creates the success card. And this is almost the same code as for the edit card. The only difference is that I'm going to uh, go ahead and update uh, the, the, uh, the number on order based on the fact that the user just updated the number on order. And then here's that message at the top, stock was updated, right? And I return that. And that's, that's basically it. That's how the whole solution works. Um, and I'm hoping that this is helpful in getting people started. Let me, um, let me go in and just say, here's the, to find the code. Oh, I can't send messages today. So um, I will just tell you, or I'll just put it here on the screen somehow, because again, I maybe this is what Vesa was trying to fix. I'm not sure. But if you go to HTTPS, aka.ms slash ignite 23 dash lab, um, that, URL is without the little stars obscuring it. <laughs> that URL will bring you to the actual hands-on labs where you can um, where you can find the code, the source code, and it will lead you through the process of. Let me just make sure this is the right URL, um, and it will actually bring you through the process of building and testing the application. So, yep, here it is, and everything is right there. Thank you.